going to head to Jeremiah just for a few moments. And uh, just as we, as we think a little about this, we will, we will um, I'll just bring to you a few illustrations from uh, the gospel truck uh, ministry. But please pray for us as a family. Uh, you'll understand and know where there's a work being done, there's a battle to be fought. And uh, please pray for the girls and Carl and, uh, and myself, and especially uh, for this week, but we'll speak a little more about that in a moment. But, you know, just while you're looking up Jeremiah 29 there, uh, when I make mention of it to, to you, uh, most of your minds will instantly go to verse 11, won't it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, of course. And, you know, that's a beautiful promise to God's children. It's a beautiful problem, or promise to the children of Israel in its original context, and it's a beautiful promise to you this morning. Jeremiah himself, of course, a prophet born in the midst of Babylonian rule, uh, then as a prophet dying in the midst of Assyrian, the other way around, rather, um, born during Assyrian rule, dying in Babylonian rule. And, you know, the life of Jeremiah it was difficult. Um, it was a time of, of chaos, it was a time of, of uncertainty, and a time of confusion, and uh, in many ways not unlike today. I was speaking to a, to a gentleman just yesterday at Balmoral, and he was sitting on a particular council fairly high up in Northern Ireland, and just at this minute in time, they're, they're, they're sitting planning on that council. It's a disaster council, and they're sitting there making emergency plans, and uh, we live in a day of, of chaos. And Jeremiah 29 is a, is a letter to the exiles, and it's in response to all of this chaos, to all of this stuff that's going on around us this morning. Uh, it's, an, it's a letter to God's people who, who, who have been carried off to Babylon, and, and of course Daniel uh, is one of them young men. And many of them at this point are just wondering how on earth they can carry on. Just what on earth is the point of it all? What on earth is the point of living in a God-glorifying way in the middle of such confusion, in the middle of a world that just doesn't seem to care? But that's far from a modern problem. That problem exists today. For the people in Babylon, for the children of Israel in Babylon, it was agonizingly real. And just perhaps it's agonizingly real for you this morning. Indeed, if you take this question one step farther, the exiles were, were more than likely asking this question, where is God? Where is God? Where is the Lord? Where is the God, the God of Israel, the God of David, the, the God of the conquests, the, the God of promises? Where is God during and in the midst of all of this chaos. They were wondering, Does God have, did God have anything to say to them? And I wonder this morning, are you wondering, does God have anything to say to us? And he does. He does. Our God is not asleep, friends. He's not a God that sleeps nor slumbers. He's awake 24-7. Let us read the Word of God together. We'll begin at verse 4, just for the sake of time. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promises to bring you back to this place. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all of the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And we'll just end there. Amen. Just let's pray, please. Our God and our Father, uh, just to be, to be honest with you this morning, uh, many of our hearts are tired and, 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 and weary. And perhaps, Father, even some of us have become uh, downcast, downbeat. And Father, we need a fresh touch from heaven this morning. And Father, only you can do this. Father, the greatest preacher that ever spoke couldn't do this. Only you, Lord. So, Father God, in these moments, please come. Holy Spirit, speak into our lives, we pray. Lord, close us in from the distractions and the thoughts of tomorrow. Lord Jesus, be glorified in all that is said in your name, we pray. Amen. Well, in good old-fashioned Presbyterian style, I do have three points for you. Uh, and uh, forgive me for that, but a surprising perspective is verses 1 to 6, uh, a surprising request is verse 7, and a surprising future is verses 8 to 14. But just who was responsible for this unbearable, unfair situation, uncertain situation? Was it Nebuchadnezzar or was it God? In the introductory narrative that we didn't take time to read, it says there in verse 1 that it was Nebuchadnezzar who carried the people into exile. But yet then in the body of the letter in verse 4 where we began, it tells us that God carried the people into exile. To all those I carried into exile. So just who was it? Who was responsible? Was it Nebuchadnezzar or was it God? And the answer this morning, of course, is that it was both. It was both. On the human level, uh, on the level of humanity, we see Nebuchadnezzar's um, violence and his cruelty, his, his destruction, his murder, and so on. We see the work of evil men. And uh, you know, one day they will answer for that. 2 Corinthians 5 and 11, 9, 10, and 11 makes that very clear. But then on God's level here, what, indeed what the eye of the prophet Jeremiah saw was that it was God who was in control. Of course, that's what the book of Jeremiah is all about from chapter 1 right up to 27. It was God at work. And you know, for the children of Israel, this was something that they just found really, really hard to handle. It would have been much easier for them to have imagined somehow or other that their God, Yahweh, the sovereign one, had somehow got preoccupied with something else and was too busy. Or perhaps that the sovereign God, Yahweh, had, had forgotten about his people. But Jeremiah proclaims in chapter 27 that although Israel was defeated and Jerusalem was destroyed at this point in history, the Lord was in full control of all events. He is the sovereign one. He is the Lord God over all of creation. And dear Christians this morning, maybe you just need to be reminded of that very simple fact afresh. He is the Almighty One. He is the All-Powerful One. There is nothing that escapes Him. There is nothing that happens without His say-so. He was in control in the prophet's day, and He is in control this morning. You know, as we head off into a week of mission, our God is in control. And that's the starting point of it all. There is nothing happens without his say-so. The gospel truck showing up in Rafo next Sunday was preordained before the beginning of time. Our God is in full control of all things. And he's in full control of your lives this morning, despite what is going on, despite the uncertainty, despite the chaos, despite the fear, perhaps. 
our God is in control. But you know, these people were struggling to understand this simple truth. Before they could even begin to contemplate this, the reality that God was in control, they first needed to settle down. They needed to get over the surprise of all that was going on around them, and they needed just to settle down. You see, what had happened to them, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple had been carried off to Babylon was God. And so, with this perspective, the prophet tells the people, settle down, he says. Settle down for a stay in Babylon that's going to last for several generations. That's verses 5 and 6. He says, get on with life. Except we are, because it, he says it isn't really going to change any time soon. He says, live out your lives. Eat, drink, marry, have children, have grandchildren. It's, it's the language of creation. It's the Abrahamic promises. For Israel here in exile, folks, there's the opportunity for a fresh start. And in many ways this morning, we are exiles in a foreign land. This old world is not our home. We're moving off, are we not, to something much more glorious. One day we will cross that river into the presence of the King. But yet in the here and now, we're called to live out our lives where God has placed us. Rafo. And you know, folks, maybe we just need to change our perspective this morning. Maybe we need to take our eyes off the chaos and the confusion and the uncertainty and place it onto the sovereign God. All around us, you know, there is fantastic opportunity for God's kingdom to grow, for the message to be proclaimed, for Christ to be exalted, and for people to be saved. The truck was sitting in Enniskillen just a few weeks ago, and now it was a quiet afternoon, to be fair. There wasn't a big lot happening, and I knew it was going to be like that. We were sitting in a car park. We were serving tea and coffee and just waiting for God to send someone, and there was a truck driver arrived. He parked his truck up about 120 yards or so on the far side of the car park. He got out of his truck, and he came across, and as I watched him come across the car park, I said to myself, boys, there's something going to happen here. Whether it be good or whether it be bad, there's something definitely going to happen. And he came up into the truck and he closed the door. He came up into the trailer and he closed the door. And here's his first words. I need your help. He says, I know nothing about God. I don't understand the Bible. But he says, I know I'm not right. A God given divine moment. I was talking to a young man the other week in Bangor on the side of the street. And again, we were serving tea and coffee and all the rest of it. And he said to me, Andrew, this old salvation business, he says, it doesn't work. And he says, I'll tell you why. His name is David. I says, why is that, David? Well, he says, if I happen to get saved today, and I live fairly good tomorrow, and I mess up on Wednesday, and I die on Thursday. He says, I'm going to hell. That's what he said to me. David, I says, if that's your gospel, I'm afraid you're right. You're going to hell. But I says, let me tell you about the gospel of grace. Let me tell you about God's gospel. And you know, there on the side of the street, he got it for the very first time. His face just lit up. And they understood that he had forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Folks, God is building his kingdom. There are tremendous opportunities everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. I talked to two men uh, yesterday, uh, two young fellas, uh, and, and, and uh, Balmoral Show, and you know, they thought it was funny. They did. They thought it was funny. And they came in and they sat down. They were after the free coffee, and that's fair enough. I have no problem with that. But as I served in the coffee, I sat down with them. I says, man, you know, what's so funny about all of this? Ah, he says, we, we're, we believe in evolution. I says, that's good enough. I says, you know, evolution is the biggest lie that's ever been sold to humanity. 
And I says, let me tell you for a while. I says, you two men, I says, you're Massey Ferguson men, did the hats and all on, you see. I says, you know, without Harry Ferguson, there never would have been a Massey Ferguson. I says, you see, there had to be a designer. There had to be a chief engineer, did there not? And folks, you see, before they left, they weren't laughing. They weren't laughing. They took Bibles, they took literature, and they left with lots to think about. Folks, God is building his kingdom amidst all of the chaos that's going on around us. Praise him. Fix your eyes upon him. Serve him. Believe in him. And let God grow his kingdom. Perhaps we need our perspective changed. Let's think about a surprising mission. That's verse 7. Also, seek the prosperity uh, and the peace of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. From, from mourners to missionaries, you might say. That's the instruction of verse 7. Totally counter to what they wanted to hear was this instruction to pray for the prosperity and the peace of Babylon. These people didn't want to pray for Babylon. Psalm 137 makes that very, very clear to us. Listen to what Psalm 137 says. It says, uh, daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction, happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. And folks, here's the application of this for us on the eve of this mission. If we're going to see the tide turn in this land again, we need to pray. And boys, I want you to pray this week. I'm serious now. I want you to pray this week like, like, like you've never prayed before. That God's going to do something. It was Spurgeon who said, prayer is the powerhouse of the work. It was J.I. Packer who said, and I think this is beautiful, Prayer is the foreordained means by which God brings his sovereign will to pass. Can you see your part in all of this? Now, you're not praying for ourselves. Not praying for the Lord to, to, uh, just to, 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 to fix our problems or to, to do something for ourselves, but, but praying that the Lord will touch the hearts and lives of those who live in our community. Praying that the Lord will draw on saved members of our families to the truck and the diamond next week and to the mission in the evening time. Folks, pray for those that are involved in this mission. I'm serious now. There is a battle to be fought here. Pray for the whole team. Pray for the students coming over from the Bible College and pray for them now that God will just anoint them and God will take them and use them for his glory. Pray for those who will minister in song. Folks, prayer changes lives. Prayer changes nations. Prayer from a clean heart. Now, that, that's, that's a very, very personal thing. But it's powerless unless it comes from a clean heart, folks. Our prayer needs to be specific. We need to get right to the core of the issue. We need to be praying for specific people and specific places and specific issues. Our prayer needs to be expectant. Our Heavenly Father, you see, He delights in giving to His children. Our prayer needs to be confident. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if He asks, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Our prayers ought to be confident. Folks, there were two ladies in the south of England. Charles Spurgeon somehow or other managed to, to get a bit of a holiday. He went to the south of England, and, and, uh, and there there was a, another pastor or minister, and, and he spied him from afar, and he rushed over to him, and he said, Mr. Spurgeon, he says, Mr. Spurgeon, I've been trying to get you to speak in my church for years, but every time I ring you, you're too busy. Would there be any chance, he says, you would come tomorrow? Well, of course, Spurgeon felt a wee bit buttonholed, did he not? And, and he had to say, yes, I'll come tomorrow. And he went on the Sunday morning, and boys, it was hard. Charles Spurgeon could hardly get the words out. He thought he never was going to get finished. And what, to make matters worse, was that he had to preach there in the evening time as well. One of these dear ladies went home, and she said to her best friend, they were due to meet for lunch, 
She says, you'll never guess what happened in our church today. Mr. Spurgeon came. Ah, the lady's friend says, well, she says, I tell you what we'll do. We'll forget about the dinner. We'll fast and we'll pray. Them two ladies prayed all afternoon. Spurgeon went back to the church that evening and there was something different. There was freedom, there was liberty, there was power. At the end of the meeting, Spurgeon issued a call to salvation and there was 500 people stood up. Spurgeon thought something had went wrong or they had misunderstood him and he told them all to sit down again. He went through it all. Again. Repentance. Take up your cross. Follow me. 500 people stood up again because God had met with them. Folks, prayer changes lives. To, to close a surprising future, um, please do pray for us this week. A surprising future, contrary to what the false prophets and the diviners were saying in verse 8, this wasn't going to be a quick fix for Israel. It was going to take 70 years before they would return to Jerusalem. This wasn't fast food. This surely wasn't Amazon Prime. This was going to require patience and endurance. And so that's why the Lord's next verse, words, verse 11, are truly glorious. In God's perfect time, he says, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promises. I will bring you back to this place. And then comes verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And folks, look, listen, here we have spilled out for us just how good it's going to be for God's people. Not some remote promise, but a promise at the, sovereign, at the forefront of our sovereign God's mind. Not merely that the Lord would, would, would bring them back to their land, but he would bring them peace and hope. You know, this verse is probably the most printed verse in all of history. It shows up just about everywhere, doesn't it? It shows up in the mugs and the calendars. It shows up on, 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 on plaques and the walls and everywhere else. But it's totally misrepresented most of the time. This is a promise to God's people. God's people at this point in history are, are under judgment. It's a promise to God's people going through a very difficult time. And our response to this verse this morning should not be a happy-go-lucky type feeling. So God's going to sort everything out for me. So I'm away off for a stroll on the beach or a walk in the park. No, that's not our response this morning. Our response, dear Christians, this morning ought to be one of praise as we reflect on the grace and the mercy of God toward a wayward people. When we fully understand the verse, it ought to drive us to our knees to prayer with a renewed determination to seek him. That's verses 12 and 14. Folks, what we have here is a promise of God that even in the fires of judgment, there can be found hope and grace and the goodness of God. I don't know where you are this morning but I really want you to hear that. In the difficult times, in the midst of the chaos, can be found the grace and the goodness and the love of God. Folks, God is building his kingdom, and I, 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 I need to finish, and I will finish, but we done a mission in Fermanagh, as I said there, and I just found out on Wednesday that uh, on the Wednesday night, we're on a drive-in service. It's very similar now to what we're going to do in Rafo. And there was two Catholic people who came in to that meeting. And there, they were converted. There, they met with God. Folks, God is amazing. God is all-powerful. Them two dear people turned up in a local parish church the following Sunday morning. Now, what a massive step. The following Sunday, the Sunday after that, they turned up again and people began to pay attention. They began to ask questions and they found out that God has spoken to them and converted them on the Wednesday evening. Folks, that's a surprising future. Um, we're no longer under the Lord's judgment, but we're under his gracious care. I am finished, I promise, but let me just finish with the gospel in these verses. 
30 seconds. Here is a people under the judgment of God, and of course, that's the way that we all arrive into this world. Here is a people whose hearts have been moved by God's grace, who in turn repent of their sin and come back to God. Verse 13, if you will seek me and find me with all of your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And that tells us very clearly that it's God's supreme will to be found this morning. And if you're outside of Christ this morning, God wants you to come into his kingdom. Why? So that no one will perish, but that all may have everlasting life. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we just thank you for these moments. And our God and our Father, prepare our hearts and our minds for Sunday week. And Father, this week, may we be a people of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.